add, 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 bill, add, ooh, a donation. Ted is eating tonight. Add, add, hello. What's this? We meet again. Dear Ted, it has been a long time. You have probably heard that I have joined the Presbyterian Church. I should just like to clarify that this was not due to our little conversation on pedobaptism, but rather from the superior argumentation of a. A. Hodges and B. B. Warfield. I am writing today with regard to a different sacrament, namely the Lord's Supper, or what you call the Eucharist. I heard tell of a presentation of yours in which you made free use of certain texts in Ignatius, Justin, and Irenaeus, in which they appear to espouse a belief in the so-called real presence. But consider the following passages in which the early church fathers clarify that the Lord's Supper is symbolic. Our friend Tertullian, having taken the bread and given it to his disciples, Jesus made it his own body, saying, This is my body, that is, the symbol of my body. Clement of Alexandria. Scripture, accordingly, has named wine the symbol of of the sacred blood. Origin. We have a symbol of gratitude to God in the bread which we call the Eucharist. Eusebius of Caesarea. For with the wine, which was indeed the symbol of his blood, he gave them bread to use as the symbol of his body. Therefore I submit that the passages you have adduced from the aforementioned fathers should not be read as teaching the real presence, and I adjure you to recant and profess true apostolic Christianity. Sincerely, Potential Spawn. Sincerely, Potential Spawn. All right. Round two. Dear Potential, Of course the Eucharist is a symbol. If you would be so good as to open your copy of the Summa to the third part, question 60, What is a Sacrament? Article 1, is a sacrament a kind of sign? You will see that, yes, a sacrament is a kind of sign. A sign of what? Skip ahead to Article 3, the respondeo. A sacrament is a sign that is both a reminder of the past, that is, the passion of Christ, and an indication of that which is affected in us by Christ's passion, that is, grace, and a prognostic, 
that is, a foretelling of future glory. Classic Thomas. The sacraments are language. The Eucharist is not just some body part lying up there on the altar, although it certainly is our Lord's body. It is also his means of communicating to us his undying love. The Eucharist symbolizes, one, our Lord's blood poured out on the cross, two, the grace that nourishes and sustains us, after all you do eat it, and three, the wedding feast of the Lamb in the heavenly Jerusalem. Past, present, and future. It is Catholic doctrine that the sacraments are symbols, but they are not just symbols. Now, let's take a look at those texts you mentioned from Ignatius, Justin, and Irenaeus. I want to pause here to give a shout out to all the sponsors who made this video possible. In particular, I want to thank one very generous patron. There's one of this patron's recent books that I want to tell you about, which everyone really should, I mean, you should have this on your bookshelf. It's actually the book adaptation of a series of lectures he gave to an RCIA class over the course of Lent one year. Then after everybody's baptized and confirmed, in the Easter season, he gives five additional lectures on the sacrament. Like I said, this just came out in the year 349, and the title of this book is The Works of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, Volume 2. You know what? You know what? I want to give you a taste of this. Why don't I open up to a random page, just completely at random, and then just start reading? All right. Okay, got it. The teaching of the Blessed Paul is of itself sufficient to give you full assurance about the divine mysteries by admission to which you have become one body and blood with Christ. For Paul just now proclaimed that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and after giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. Then taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take, drink, this is my blood. When the master himself has explicitly said of the bread, this is my body, will anyone still dare to doubt? When he is himself our warranty, saying, this is my blood, who will ever waver and say it is not his blood? Once at Cana in Galilee, he changed water into wine by his sovereign will. Is it not credible then that he changed wine into blood? Ooh, look at this on the next page. Do not then think of the elements as bare bread and wine. They are, according to the Lord's declaration, the body and blood of Christ. Though sense suggests the contrary, let faith be your stay. Instead of judging the matter by taste, let faith give you an unwavering confidence that you have been privileged to receive the body and blood of Christ. Wow. That's, uh, that's really topical. Thanks, Cyril. Anyway, back to the video. St. Ignatius of Antioch, on his way to martyrdom in Rome, about AD 110, wrote against the heresy of docetism. This was the belief that it was somehow beneath our Lord to take on a human body, since the material world is so tawdry and base. He only seemed to have a body. Dokeo meaning to seem, kind of like a hologram. For instance, in the Gnostic Acts of John, the apostle remarks that he followed our Lord all over Galilee, but I never saw a footprint. Against this unbelief, Ignatius argues forcefully for the truth of the incarnation. But he goes further. Not only did our Lord come in the flesh in first century Roman Judea, he still appears bodily to us in the Eucharist, which Ignatius calls the medicine of immortality. The Docetists, of course, found the Eucharist just as offensive as the bodily incarnation, as Ignatius writes, for love, that is charity, they have no care, none for the widow, none for the orphan, none for the distressed, none for the afflicted, none for the prisoner, or for him released from prison, none for the hungry or thirsty. 
They abstain from Eucharist and prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who suffered for our sins, which the Father raised up by his goodness. Do you see the connection between belief in the Incarnation and belief in the Eucharist? Deny one, and you will soon find yourself denying the other. Note also the surprising connection to practical charity. If you think about it, of course Docetists didn't take care of the poor. Why prolong their base and tawdry existence in material bodies? In the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, the apostles ask our Lord, in what way should we give alms? He answers eventually, if you give alms, you will do harm to your spirits. The True Christians, on the other hand, have always practiced charity. Why? Because God cared for our bodies enough to take on a body in the Incarnation. And he feeds our bodies with his body in the Eucharist. If we are filled with the love of God, how can we do otherwise? How can a Christian neglect the suffering bodies of the poor? All this is inseparable from the real presence. I think this is a good place to stop for another word from our sponsors. This next book I want to tell you about is called St. Ambrose Theological and Dogmatic Works. You know what? You know what? I wonder if there's something in here on the Eucharist. Okay. Okay, six books on the sacraments. Oh yeah, oh yeah, here we go. You perhaps say, my bread is usual, but that bread is bread before the words of the sacraments. When consecration has been added from bread, it becomes the flesh of Christ. So let us confirm this. How is it possible that what is bread is the body of Christ? By what words then is the consecration and by whose expressions? By those of the Lord Jesus. For all the rest that are said in the preceding are said by the priest. Praise to God, prayer is offered, there is a petition for the people, for kings, for the rest. When it comes to performing a venerable sacrament, then the priest uses not his own expressions, but he uses the expressions of Christ. Thus, the expression of Christ performs this sacrament. What is the expression of Christ? Surely that by which all things were made. Skipping ahead. If then there is so great force in the expression of the Lord Jesus that those things might begin to be which were not, how much more creating that those things be which were and be changed to something else? Therefore, to reply to you, there was no body of Christ before consecration. But after the consecration, I say to you that now there is the body of Christ. He himself spoke, and it was made. He himself commanded, and it was created. Well, there you have it. Big thank you to St. Ambrose for his very generous patronage. Once again, this is St. Ambrose Theological and Dogmatic Works, and this just came out in the year 390. Make sure you check out the link in the description below. Back to the video. St. Justin Martyr wrote his first apology around AD 155, in response to a number of slanders being circulated against the Christians, including that we were cannibals, because Christians were always talking about eating the body and drinking the blood of that Christ fellow. To dispel these rumors, Justin explains what actually goes on in Christian worship. And so you would expect he would avail himself of the opportunity to clarify that the bread and wine are just symbols and totally not the actual body and blood of Christ. So what does he write? We call this food the Eucharist, of which only he can partake who has acknowledged the truth of our teachings, who has been cleansed by baptism for the remission of his sins and for regeneration, hmm. and who regulates his life upon the principles laid down by Christ. Not as ordinary bread or as ordinary drink do we partake of them, but just as, through the word of God, our Savior Jesus Christ became incarnate 
and took upon himself flesh and blood for our salvation, so we have been taught the food which has been made the Eucharist by the prayer of his word, and which nourishes our flesh and blood by assimilation, is both the flesh and the blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. He then quotes the words of institution from the Gospels. Justin had every incentive to deny the real presence, and yet he refuses to do so. Why? It's that phrase there. We have been taught. Justin was not at liberty to jettison belief in the real presence because it had been handed down by the apostles. The Eucharist is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. The incarnation implies the Eucharist. I've got to say, I was kind of surprised when this next patron reached out to me, but hey, I'll take sponsorships where I can get them. This next sponsor is the Council of Jerusalem of AD 1672, basically the Eastern Orthodox Church's equivalent to the Council of Trent. I like this book because it shows that belief in the real presence is not just a Western Catholic thing. The Orthodox have very generously made this available for free online. So make sure you check the link in the description below so you can access this. I just want to give you a sample here. This is from Decree 17. We believe the all-holy mystery of the sacred Eucharist. In the celebration whereof we believe the Lord Jesus Christ to be present, not typically, nor figuratively, nor by superabundant grace, as in the other mysteries, nor by a bare presence, as some of the fathers have said concerning baptism, or by impination, so that the divinity of the word is united to the set forth bread of the Eucharist hypostatically, as the followers of Luther most ignorantly and wretchedly suppose, but truly and really, so that after the consecration of the bread and of the wine, the bread is transmuted, transubstantiated, converted, and transformed, into the true body itself of the Lord, which was born in Bethlehem of the Ever-Virgin, was baptized in the Jordan, suffered, was buried, rose again, was received up, sitteth at the right hand of the God and Father, and is to come again in the clouds of heaven. And the wine is converted and transubstantiated into the true blood itself of the Lord, which, as he hung upon the cross, was poured out for the life of the world." Further, we believe that after the consecration of the bread and of the wine, there no longer remaineth the substance of the bread and of the wine, but the body itself and the blood of the Lord, under the species and form of bread and wine, that is to say, under the accidents of the bread. Skipping ahead. Further, that the body itself of the Lord and the blood that are in the mystery of the Eucharist ought to be honored in the highest manner and adored with latria. Further, that it is a true and propitiatory sacrifice offered for all Orthodox, living and dead, and for the benefit of all, as is set forth expressly in the prayers of the mystery delivered to the Church by the Apostles, in accordance with the command they received of the Lord. Wow. So, a big thank you to the Council of Jerusalem for sponsoring this video, and to the Eastern Orthodox Church for holding the line on the Real Presence. Back to the video. St. Irenaeus brings the story full circle. He, like Ignatius, was writing against the Gnostics, although a generation later, about AD 185. But he takes it a step further and deeper. It's an amazing passage. The cup, which is part of creation, he declares to be his blood, by which our own blood is fortified. And the bread, which is part of creation, he affirms to be his body, by which our own body is fortified. So then, if the mixed cup and the manufactured bread receive the word of God and become the Eucharist, that is to say, the blood and body of Christ, which fortify and build up the substance of our flesh, how can these people claim that the flesh is incapable of receiving God's gift of eternal life when it is nourished by Christ's body and blood and is his member? Our bodies having been nourished by the Eucharist, having been laid to rest in the earth, having there been dissolved, will rise again at their appointed time. For the word of God will grant them resurrection to the glory of God the Father. You see how important the real presence is for Irenaeus. It is the linchpin of his entire system. 
guaranteeing against the Gnostics, one, the truth of the Incarnation, two, the goodness of creation, three, the value and worth of our bodies, and four, the resurrection of those bodies on the last day. In fact, it is our reception of the Eucharist that effects that resurrection. Taking the Lord's body into our bodies transforms them into his likeness. You are what you eat. Hope this helps. Grace be with you. Yes, all the writers you cited believed in the real presence.